Gunner, Tracy, Rob, thank you so much for leading us this morning in worship. Great to be led uh, this morning. Uh, it is so good to be together, and I want to welcome you as, as uh, Jeff Fox did as well. Uh, we're both Jeff, so it gets a little confusing around here. Uh, but we're really glad you're here uh, this morning, and it is great to, to worship the Lord together and to gather with one another. Uh, a couple of things that I want to let you guys know about. One is, um, so Colby Barrett, who's right here, um, in fact, I'm going to grab the mic for you. He's going to come share with us a little bit. He is, um, get that off here. So the, you know, one of the things that's interesting about us as Christians, as believers in Jesus, is that our compassion and what we hear from the Lord, what we experience from him, we want that compassion to also go out. But a lot of times our compassion, it stays there. Um, and there's an opportunity for us in any setting, every time we walk out these doors and even in these doors, to let that compassion that we receive from the Lord flow out into others. And so one of the things that I have been really encouraged with talking to Colby the last few weeks is that his, God's compassion on Colby has led him to have compassion for what's happening in the world that's led him now to take an action. And so I'm going to let him share about what God's put on uh, his heart as he is um, heading out tomorrow on a trip. So I'll let you kind of yeah. share more about it, Colby. Right. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Colby Barrett. I'm headed to Ukraine tomorrow. Um, I feel very strongly called to help there uh, with what's going on. I wanted to ask for prayers from the church as I head out. Uh, there's specifically three areas I'm looking for, for help with. Uh, the first, I'll be entering the country on an aid convoy organized by a nonprofit called Zero Line. So specifically, I'll be driving a fire truck that was donated by the Finnish government uh, to the front lines. Uh, so that's going to be used to put out fires, especially related to missile attacks on civilian infrastructure and those kind of things. So I've never driven anything bigger than a Cruise America <laughs> rental RV. So in terms of like prayers for safety, me in a fire truck, like send those along, please. <laughs> um, after the aid convoy gets done delivering their hum humanitarian supplies, I'm leading a team that's producing a documentary that's talking about the suffering of Christians in the Russian-occupied portions of Ukraine. And some of these stories are just heartbreaking, right? People that have been tortured by Russian forces, uh, people that have lost their pastors, friends, family. Um, I'll be talking to the folks that have made it out. Um, I'm also talking to a few of the kids that were <coughs> abducted and forcibly brought into Russia, and it's, I think about 3% have made it out. Um, these are heavy, heavy stories. And frankly, I'm really nervous about being able to tell this right. Um, so I would ask for prayers around being able to tell these stories in a way that honors these people as children of God, honors their pain, honors their suffering, and then honors our shared faith in Jesus. Um, so that's kind of the second piece. And then um, the last is kind of um, really around uh, my ability to accomplish this mission without fear. Uh, so I, I'm not actually scared for this trip, but I am deeply uncomfortable, <laughs> as you <laughs> might, <laughs> might guess. Uh, this mix of emotions, it feels right as I follow what I feel is God's calling here, right? Um, there's a quote from Christian author Francis Chan in his book, uh, Crazy Love, where he said, God doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust him so completely that we're unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we would be in real trouble if he doesn't come through. Um, so that last prayer I would ask, this is probably the biggest one, is that my heart is just continually open to God accomplishing what he wants through me um, and to do this without fear. Uh, knowing that I'm gonna be uncomfortable the whole time I'm away from Telluride and this amazing church and my family, um, I would just ask for, for me to be uh, uh, accomplishing his will without fear as I go forward. So, awesome. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Colby. Appreciate it. Let's stand up here real quick. Yeah. Yep. Um, I want to pray uh, for Colby um, and for their family uh, as he goes. And uh, let's just pray. Father, we're so thankful uh, for Colby and for his um, listening to you and his responding to you to go and to. Uh, bring aid and to bring comfort uh, to bring the love of God and, and Lord especially as he goes and interacts with um, those who have been um, tortured and persecuted for their faith in Jesus Lord I pray that you would allow that story to be told um, so that again as believers here we might um, be able to connect and have our hearts aligned with Christians around the world who might be experiencing something very similar uh, and Lord we do pray uh, we want to pray with Colby and Leslie and their family uh, for his safety, um, for his uh, protection all the way through, 
Uh, and Lord, we ask that you would guide him. And, and as he goes, Lord, may he um, know that he has the prayers of his family, but he has the prayers of his church as well. Uh, and as he's sent out to go and to accomplish this mission, um, Lord, may he, um, again, know that he is being sent from you and from this church and from this place um, to, uh, to continue to, to invest in what you have called him to do. And so, Lord, we thank you that it is compassion that has driven this mission. Um, and we pray for him and for his family through all of this, especially as he leaves tomorrow. And so we entrust him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Colby, for sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah, Colby will be up here. Like, if you want to chat with him more about um, all that God has led him to do. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, it was, uh, it's fitting that today, um, it, not something we planned, but uh, the songs uh, that we sang were all about God's love. All about God's pursuing his reckless, his unending, his unconditional, his pursuing, uh, I think I already said that, but I'll say it again, pursuing love that he puts on us. And I think it's fitting that we started that way because um, today we're, we're going to continue to talk about relationships and in particular our marriage relationship. And as we think about what love looks like, as we think about what intimacy looks like with one another, it is so important that we recognize it all starts with God's unending, unconditional, unconditional pursuing love of us. And so it is great. Thank you uh, for picking those songs today, uh, Gunnar and Tracy and Rob, so that we might sing of God's love. When I uh, lived in Dallas, <clears throat> uh, one Saturday I was at the gym. I was working out, and I noticed this guy that I see at the gym all the time, and um, he's probably, you know, early 60s, and he's one of those guys you can tell has been lifting weights a long time. He's really strong. And I always saw him. He always had these red Bose headphones on and his workout shirt and his workout shorts, and just that's how I saw him all the time. And so this time I'm, I'm out there working on a Saturday morning, working out, and I'm up on the treadmill, and he is in, this time, in the racquetball court. Now, if you can imagine this gym, the racquetball court is completely open air, so everyone can see through the, through the window every, whatever's happening in the racquetball court. And so there he is. I see him, I, as I always see him. He's got his red Bose headphones on. He's got his workout shirt and his workout shorts. But this time, he has on dress socks and dress shoes, which is a great look, by the way, you know, with <laughs> workout shorts. Um, and I, I'm like, oh, okay, what's he doing in there? And I, I noticed him, and so, of course, I'm doing a double take, and I'm just kind of up there, you know, right in front of him walking it, watching this, and I look over, and he is ballroom dancing <laughs> by himself, like, you know, all the kind of moves of, you know, ballroom dancing. And I was like, is anyone else seeing this? <laughs> like, I mean, he's in the racquetball court. It's all, I mean, everyone can see that he is ballroom dancing by himself it, with his workout socks on, with his business socks on, uh, with his workout clothes. And, uh, and at, first, at first, of course, I'm like, man, this, I got to love the boldness for this guy. You know, he's just willing to do this. He could have done this at home in the privacy of his own home, but he's doing it on the racquetball court for everyone to see. Uh, but then I kind of got a little sad. I was like, oh, he, I mean, he needs like a partner. He doesn't have a partner. He's dancing with by himself. But then it kind of hit me. I was like, there's only one reason that he's actually doing this on a Saturday morning by himself in the racquetball court with his, you know, business socks and his dress shoes is he's practicing for what probably is going to happen that night. He's going to go ballroom dancing. And I think probably a lot of people thought, you know, he shows up to, to ballroom dance on Saturday night, and he's just naturally good at ballroom dancing. But I know, and now the whole gym knows, uh, <laughs> that the racquetball dancer <laughs> practices every single morning. He gets up there, and he does his moves. And he was fancy. I don't know much about ballroom dancing, but he was doing all kinds of moves. That's probably a ballroom dancing move, right? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And he's just, up, he's so, he's getting into it. And I thought, here he is, he's practicing. You know, a lot of people work out to get buff. You know, a lot of people work out for the endorphins. A lot of people work out because they just want to have a healthy lifestyle. This guy works out because he wants to be the best ballroom dancer on Saturday nights every single night at the club. And so what is that about that? It was, I noticed here he does not just show up having this figured out. He practices. He works at it. He spends time investing in something that he loves so that when he has a partner that night, he knows what he's doing. Now, it's interesting, as, as I said, we've been kind of slowing down on our series on Ephesians uh, on this focus on marriage. And, and as Paul talks about and highlights the importance of marriage, and as he, as we looked at last week, talks about the call in singleness as well, what we recognize is that, that so often, and part of the reason we've slowed down, is that so often we have a cultural lens by which we see marriage and singleness. 
And that pervades our thoughts on this more than the scriptures do. And what I think one cultural lens that we put on is this idea that even though we all know that relationships aren't easy, there's this subtle lie underneath it all that says that if this relationship was good, if this relationship was right, if this relationship was fulfilling, or if this was true love, then it wouldn't take so much work. I could just show up and it would all happen. Right? But like the racquetball dancer, we got to do the work as we prepare to engage in a relationship. There's work to be done, and there's something that I think, there's this word that, is, that we see uh, and understand about the scriptures is this word intimacy. Now, this word intimacy has kind of been hijacked in our culture. It's meant to really only mean sex. That's the, what our culture typ- typically uses it for. But the word is so much fuller than that. Intimacy is a word that means a close, familiar, personal relationship with another person or with something. We might use this term sometimes to say we have you know, intimate knowledge of this file, right? I, I know this file frontwards and backwards. I know it through and through. We, we use that idea to understand like we have a full knowledge of it. Or sometimes we use that word intimate to talk about a setting like this. Oh, it's an intimate setting. It means it's warm, it's comfortable, it's, it's welcoming. So we use this word in other settings, but when it comes to a relationship, we apply all of that to understand that, that the quality of being both comfortable and warm or familiar, uh, it's this detailed understanding of that person. It is, to put it simply, to be known and to know. And in some ways, I am convinced that this is actually the longing of all of our hearts. It's to know and to be known, to truly be known for who we are. Not the image we put up, not the mask we wear, not for our success or for our failure, not for what we can bring to the table, but to be truly known for who we are and to be loved in that. And the point here, I believe, throughout the scriptures, is that God created inside of us that desire to be known and to be loved, because he alone can fulfill it. He is the only one who, as we just sang all about his love, he is the only one who can actually know us perfectly, through and through, warts and all, and love us unconditionally. Now, after all that Paul says about marriage in Ephesians 5, um, he says this little line. He quotes Genesis. In Ephesians 5, 31, he says this. Therefore, After all that he said about marriage that we've looked at the last few weeks, he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Intimacy. Now, Paul is taking us all the way back to the beginning. He's quoting Genesis, and I want to go back to Genesis because I want us to look at this for a minute. As we understand that, that how God created the world helps us understand a little more about what his intentions were for it and how he created us. Now, we go all the way back to Genesis and we think about the beginning. And if you remember, in the creation account, each day God creates something unique. And each day he says, it is good. It is good. It is good. And then he creates man. And in Genesis 2, verse 18, he says this. He says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Now here's what I want us to see about this. In this perfect, good creation that God has made, he creates humanity in his own image. And he makes this very profound statement. He says it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, we are hardwired and we are built for relationships. Now, that should not surprise us because we're made in the image of God who is a relational God. He is by nature, the Godhead is Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit has been in a relationship in eternity past, will be in a relationship for eternity future. And so we are created in his image. We are made as relational beings. And he says there's not a helper suitable for him. This word helper could be, uh, it probably most literally means counterpart. It's actually like but opposite. That's kind of what the word means, a complement. 
And so there's not, there wasn't someone, he looks at all the animals and says there's not some, someone who can be a sufficient complement to this humanity, to this creation. And so as we've looked at over the last few weeks, it, it doesn't mean that marriage is required or the only way for there to be relationships, but it does mean that in creation, we were not meant to be alone. We are not meant to be isolated. We are not meant to be loners. We were created for relationships. We were created to know others and to be known by others. We were created for intimacy, knowing and being known fully by another person, complementing each other in deep relationship. Now, look how he continues to describe this. Keep reading with me, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father. Here's that quote that we read from Ephesians. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, here's the description of intimacy. One flesh. Bone of my bones, he says. Flesh of my flesh. Obviously, Adam is saying that she's made of the same stuff I'm made of. I mean, all the animals, all the birds, they're great and all, but they're not a human counterpart. And so he says, this person is one flesh. But then there's this really powerful statement that I think we can miss because we read it, we might blaze over it. But he says, we're one flesh. He says, they were naked and unashamed. What a powerful statement. Unashamed. They felt no shame. They felt no hurt, no pain, no erosion of trust, no selfishness, no relationship simply for what I can get out of it. This is the description of intimacy or deep relationship before sin came into the world. This is how God created us relationally. That we were meant to be vulnerable, unashamed, honest, nothing held back. It's intimacy. Now, this is the ideal picture of open and vulnerable relationships, friendships, uh, but specifically here, marriage. That God's view of intimacy is not defined as only sex. We see from the very beginning there is emotional intimacy, there's spiritual intimacy, there's relational intimacy, and then physical intimacy in marriage is actually meant to be a picture of this relational, emotional, and spiritual intimacy that we are invited to with one another and with God. And so before sin enters the world, before sin comes in and just messes everything up, intimacy is defined as completely vulnerable, honest, open, with no shame, no erosion of trust, naked and unashamed, to know someone else and to be fully known by someone else. Now, the reality is, we know that we turn one page over in the Bible and we see that everything falls apart. And the reality is that many of us and many of the people we talk to feel alone. They feel kind of like, well, yeah, maybe it's not good for a man to be alone, but I feel alone whether I'm married or I'm single. We know there is brokenness in this. And because sin enters the world, and we'll talk more about this here in a second, Everything is broken, including our relationships. In fact, we jump down to chapter 3, verse 7. I don't think I have this on the screen. But it, then the eyes of both were opened after they eat the, the fruit. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Intimacy is broken. Intimacy is broken because of sin entering into the world. And the rest of chapter 3 talks about these four breaks that happen because of this. I've talked about this before, but I think it's so important for us. In our understanding of what sin really means, there's a lot of people, people talk about sin, but it really means and what the consequences of it are, but also in the beauty of the salvation that God comes to give. And so there's a couple of things. One, there's this break with our intimacy with God. This break, we're kicked out of the perfect garden. Shortly after this, they have to leave the garden because this was a place of God's perfection. And so there's this break with this intimacy with God. There's a break in our perfect intimacy with one another. That immediately they begin to blame each other and do all kinds of other stuff. They put on fig leaves. 
there's this break, if you will, kind of putting it this way, uh, of intimacy with ourselves, of fully knowing who we are. Because what do they experience for the first time? They experience shame, something that is so deep, and yet they immediately are broken inside. And then break, if you will, sort of this perfect intimacy with the land. The land of the earth was meant to be working. We were meant to work with the land for perfect human flourishing, and now we have thorns and thistles. And so that's the breaks that happen. And so if we think about it like this, what we recognize is that sin is the enemy of our intimacy. Our deep longing, our deep longing to be known and to know someone intimately, but sin keeps us from one another. Now, when I say that, I, when I say sin here, I'm not just talking about sins we commit. I'm talking about a broader definition. Sin is the reason for the corruption, the brokenness. Yes, we sin, but also because of sin, the world is broken. Because of sin, we have been sinned against. This, it's all in this definition. Because of that, these systems of sin prevail and keep going over generations over generations. So the whole thing is broken. That's what I mean by sin as the enemy of intimacy. And so when we show up to a relationship, whether that's a friendship or a dating relationship or a marriage, we bring with us a suitcase or two of baggage or three or four. <laughs> baggage that has damaged our ability to be intimate and to be vulnerable emotionally, relationally, spiritually, in all relationships, and even often physically in marriage. The word vulnerable comes from this root of a word that means taking down your shield in battle. Nobody does that. You would never move your shield out of the way because you know what's coming is the arrows. We've been alive long enough to know that when we move the shield out of the way, the arrows come and we get hurt by that. But this is this idea of vulnerability. It means open, vulnerable, fully trusting, no shield, no mask, just who you are. And again, this is scary for us because the arrows will come and they will wound us. And I think for us, as we think about this idea of intimacy, again, going back to the racquetball dancer, we need to do a little work here. We need to do a little practice here. We need to understand our particular baggage that hinders intimacy, that hinders us being fully known or knowing someone fully. And sometimes that actually is just sin between us, that we've done something intentionally or unintentionally to hurt one another. Other times that is sin that has been done to us either now or in the past. But often it's just a brokenness that is deeper than that. It's a way in which we just have grown up in a world where we put on loincloths. We try to cover, we try to, we try to break down, the, we put up shields, we put up masks, all these things because we are afraid of being hurt because we've been hurt so many times. And so we need to deal with the root issues. We're pursuing intimacy with a limp. I think it's important for us to know that. The first one that we need to deal with the root issue is trust. When trust has been eroded, whether that's from a past relationship or a current one, it hinders us from being able to be completely open. Uh, that means that it's more difficult for us to find comfort or acceptance or relief for us when we're in a relationship. It's because we've taken the shield down, we've, our trust has been hurt in that. And so we recognize that it's harder for us to be vulnerable. And this trust doesn't have to be, this lack of trust doesn't have to be a traumatic event. Uh, it could be something small or even small, slow things over time that erode our trust in one another. And often because of that, we convince ourselves, some of us, to, to never need anyone. This idea of, well, I'll just make sure I'll just be that self-person, I'll, I'll be self-made man, self-person who just says, hey, I don't need anyone. Some of us, we don't want to be inconvenienced, but some of us, we don't want to inconvenience anyone else because we feel like if we need them, then that will be a vulnerability. And you see all of this is out of a lack of trust. Relationships are meant to be a two-way street. We talked about a few weeks ago, every relationship in Christ is meant to be submitting to one another. And in particular in marriage, it is meant to be this constant submission and dying for another. And so that means we will have to be open about our needs. We will have to put others' needs above our own, which means we'll have to do the same thing. We have to step in and trust. And needing each other and serving each other is part of the way intimate relationships are designed. But that hinders our intimacy quotient, if you will. In all relationships, again, friendships, dating, and marriage. Uh, over the years, I, I've found a book that um, has been helpful for us called How We Love. And it's a helpful tool in discovering what hinders us in intimacy. Now, it's a book, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in so a minute. It's not a normal thing to do, but just go with me for a few minutes on this. It's a book that talks about um, the psychological understanding of attachment theory, which is really about how do we attach early on. 
How do we receive love? How do we give love? And the way we learn that the earliest in our life is actually what impacts how we love one another and how we receive love in adulthood. And in this book, again, I found very helpful, um, he identifies a couple of patterns. I call them loincloths. They're things that we put on to keep us or shields or mask, whatever you want to call them. And, and he identifies a couple. One, there's an avoider. The avoider learned early to minimize their feelings and be independent and meet their own needs. Just avoid. Go away. When you can, it comes to conflict, how do I just avoid? Then there's the pleaser. The pleaser learns to be cautious, tries hard to, to be perfect in order to avoid criticism and keep the peace. Not necessarily make peace, but keep the peace. The vacillator found uh, early on the connection was something sometimes available but unpredictable. They were often left waiting. So by the time attention was offered, they were too angry to receive it. There's often, for this kind of uh, uh, person, there's often um, a, a root of anx- an anxious core or sometimes even anger beneath the surface. And then there's the victim. And the victim learned early on that whatever abuse that came to them, they had to cover their fears either by fighting back or controlling their life or detaching and complying. Now, in each way, these categories are just brokenness in our intimacy. And the way those play out in conflict, oftentimes, it looks really strange. And sometimes it even if we just call it what it is, it looks almost childish. And yet there's something that is broken in us because of sin, our own sin, sin done to us in the, in the world of sin that we live in that it breaks our intimacy. And if we can do that work to say, how do I identify? How do I understand what I need to grow in so that I can continue to invest in intimate relationships and take the mask down, take the loincloths off, move the shield out of the way so that I can be vulnerable and open with one another. And he identifies a a few ways. I'll just kind of run through these and you might just listen to these to see if um, some of these hit home. Again, Like the dancer, before we even come to have a partner, these issues are there. And so walk with me through these. Um, A couple of ways that we deal with conflict. One is regression. Uh, If I'm uh, angry or hurt, sometimes I act in childish ways. I pout or sulk. Or maybe I have what I like to call adult temper tantrums. They look a little different than child temper tantrums. Uh, Suppression. I strap myself so I don't have to feel or deal with what is bothering me and practically erase unpleasant experiences. Withdrawal, when I'm hurt or upset, I physically leave or just go off on my own thoughts. Blame, this is the most common. Other people cause most of my problems, and I act and feel the way I do because of them. If they would change, everything would be fine. Remember in the garden, the first thing Adam says to God when God says, what have you done? He says, that woman that you gave me. (laughs) He immediately blames the woman, but who else? God who gave that woman to him. Blame. It's that first reaction. Rationalization also, this is the second most common. It's easy to tell myself the wrong things I do aren't that bad when I compare myself to what most people in the world are doing. Wrong. Devaluation. When I'm upset, I focus on uh, the negative traits of others. Those traits are always more numerous and pronounced than my own. Or the opposite of this is a devaluation of self. A self-hatred, a self-condemnation that just says, I'm the problem. I'm always the problem. And you go down into that cycle. Intellect, intellectualization, I can analyze my way out of any feeling or emotion. Compensation, I feel the need to exaggerate my good points in order to hide my deficiencies. Denial, I refuse to acknowledge pain and problems and call it having a positive attitude. Replacement, when I'm feeling a negative emotion, I express the opposite in order to hide the truth. Or just good old-fashioned distraction, I avoid conflict or pain by filling the day with anything and everything. Um, we can see, likely, our own tendencies in this. It may not be how we act all the time, but there's a tendency in us because sin is st- we still have sin nature. And because of sin done to us and sin in our culture, that this is sometimes how we operate. These are the fig leaves and others that we put on when it comes to intimacy. And our own coverings, the reason we do it is it's out of self-preservation, but they fall short and they hinder us from intimacy. Our intimacy quotient is broken, and we put up defense mechanisms that keep us from being truly open and vulnerable um, or able to be wounded. Now, I I think it's a helpful question. Like I said, this isn't our normal kind of Sunday morning thing. We don't normally go into this, but I think it's a helpful question for us to ask ourselves. What do I see in myself and I? What are the areas that are broken, the areas that sin has impacted me, and that it's being played out in my relationships? 
If you're single, you have patterns that you take into your friendships that hinder closeness. If you're single and you hope to get married one day, you will take these patterns into your marriage. If you're married, you probably live out these patterns in your marriage in one way or another, as well as in other relationships. But I'm convinced as we recognize our intimacy quotient is broken, then we are able then to say, how can we now move more towards this idea and this beautiful picture of one flesh, of intimacy and of openness? And it's worth doing the work. It promotes healthy communication where we are actually then able to go, I can seek awareness of my spouse or other people's feelings and needs, and I can engage in those feelings. I don't have to run from them or do any of these things that we typically do. We can listen to one another. We can engage one another. And then we can seek to resolve these issues healthily. Now, that's the counseling portion of this sermon. <laughs> um, but I think it's important before we get, and all of this is really good and important, but before we even get there, we have to remember the foundation. These foundational themes that we have looked at these last few weeks as we've been, as we've been pausing and slowing down on what the Bible says about marriage. Because if we don't go back to this foundation, we'll actually never grow out of this. We'll never grow into any of these realms of intimacy. And so we started, as the book of Ephesians does, with identity. All this book is about is about the fact that we are in Christ. It is about how that identity has shaped literally everything about us, including our relationships. And our identity is not defined by our marital status. It's not defined by success. It's not defined by an image that we put forth. It's our identity is simply, as we sang, as a loved, redeemed, forgiven child of God that gives us a security, that allows us to interact with others with a security and a confidence. And when, what that identity leads to, as we have looked at the last few weeks, is it leads to a contentment that is based, again, simply on this fundamental identity of who we are in Christ. It's not in our marriage that it would be fulfilling. It's not in our singleness that it would be fulfilling. It is our contentment is based on what God has done for us in the relationship we have with him. And that actually frees us up to live in intimacy. Recognizing everything God is doing is conforming us into the image of Christ. Everything he's doing, marriage, singleness, trial, happiness, joys, sadness, all of it, he is doing so that we might become more and more into the image of Christ. This is the bigger picture that Christ is doing in us. And so when we have this secure identity in Christ, it breeds a contentment that is not based on circumstances. We can recognize that everything is for our spiritual growth. Therefore, as we talked about in the first week, we can put others' needs above our own. We can live out this idea of mutual submission. We can live out this idea of sacrifice and of dying for one another. And all of this actually is what builds intimacy. It's what builds closeness. It's what builds vulnerability, knowing and being known. Now, it all comes back to what Paul said as we've looked at each week. He's talking about marriage, and he's talking about all the beauty of marriage, but he keeps comparing it to the relationship of God and his church. And in verse 32, he says, This mystery is profound, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. All of this comes back, again, foundationally, to the covenant that God has made with us as his children. God doesn't break covenant. That's who he is. We break it all the time. But God does not break it. And because of that, in his perfect covenant-keeping love, he says, I have set my love upon you, and I have established a covenant with you. And if sin is the enemy of intimacy, then what Jesus has done when he came to this earth is he has solved our foundational problem. If the deepest longing in all of us is to know and be known, the only real answer to that is if we are known by God, and we can know him because of his unconditional love. And that frees us up to actually be known, to be vulnerable, to be unashamed. Because success or failure or acceptance or rejection, they're not hanging in the balance of our every interaction. And we know we failed. That's part of the whole story. And yet we know in God's infinite grace, he has forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. And that gives us the freedom to then have grace for one another. Because you know what? 
you're married, your spouse is also dealing with the same kind of issues or maybe different issues, but we have grace for one another because we know we're all trying to grow in this and this foundation of intimacy with the Lord that frees us up to then have intimacy with one another. We already know that we're not rejected. We're not rejected. But we're fully accepted by the God of the universe. I'm not saying that human rejection won't still have a sting. But it changes that view because our life is not hoping that every transaction will fill our cup with acceptance. Our cup is already full. That's the story of the gospel. That God in his great love has already filled our cup. And out of that, we then operate with one another. It impacts the most basic human need. Intimacy in relationships. To know and to be fully known. And if we understand this whole story of what God is doing and what Christ has done, then we recognize that we go all the way back to the beginning and we see those four breaks. We know that one day Jesus will return and he will make a new heaven and a new earth. And the way the earth just doesn't work for us, the way our bodies don't work, the way physical things don't work, God's going to heal all of that. And we long for that day where Jesus will, will reconcile the world back to how it was meant to be and how he originally created it. And we know that the gospel It also reorients our identity so we don't have to live in shame anymore. In the gospel, it's the ministry of reconciliation so that we can be quick to forgive, quick to reconcile, and we can move towards intimacy with one another. And lastly, because of Jesus, we are invited into intimacy with God where we are fully known and fully loved. Even before... God banishes them from the garden. I want to notice what he does here. Back to Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. Now, before he sends them out of the garden, he actually clothes them. Now, I want us just to take a minute to notice what he does here. How did he do that? How does he give him garments? He has to kill an animal to give them what they need. You see, a sacrifice had to be made to meet their need. And this, even in this one little moment, is a foreshadowing of what would come, that Jesus would be that ultimate lamb, that ultimate sacrifice who would come and die once and for all for all of us so that our intimacy with God could be unbroken and so that we could pursue an intimacy with each other that could be unbroken. You see what Christ has come to do because of it. He has restored our relationship back to him. And again, this is the foundation. Every single week as we've talked about all the things we want to work on within the context of our marriages, all of it comes back to this foundation that what Christ has done for us, he did once and for all. Why? Because of his great and unconditional and reckless and pursuing love that we can hardly even find. But he set his love upon us, and he has called us children of God, changing our fundamental identity so that then everything now flows out of that. Our biggest need to be known and to know has been met in Jesus, and that then impacts everything else we do. Let's pray. 